Hello, my viewers, and welcome back to my channel, where we take a look into a thought-provoking discussion that challenges conventional narratives and sheds light on untold stories. Now, today we embark on a journey of discovery as we explore the origins of palm coloredness and its implications for contemporary society. It's a powerful testament to the complexity of racial identity. A brother takes us into the historical roots of palm coloredness, revealing a narrative often overlooked in mainstream discourse. Now, he highlights a fundamental truth that many palm color individuals are unaware of the historical processes that shaped their identity and perpetuate systems of WS. As our speaker illuminates, the concept of palm coloredness as we know it today did not exist before the middle of the 17th century. Prior to this, individuals in Europe identified based on their nationality or ethnicity rather than a unified racial category of palm color. Now, this distinction challenges prevailing notions and prompts us to reconsider the construction of racial identities. Drawing on the insights of esteemed historian Dr. Neil Ivan Penter, we uncover the pivotal role of palm coloredness in justifying the enslavement and subjugation of African people. Through her seminal work, The History of Palm Color People, Dr. Penter unravels the intricate layers of European identity formation, revealing the systemic exploitation and dehumanization embedded within the construct of palm coloredness. Now, some people will not understand or listen to this, it coming from a brother, but maybe you should watch the last two clips coming from palm color people. How did white people become white people? I'm so glad you asked. I find that most white people have no idea how they came to identify as white. And because they don't know that history, they often fundamentally misunderstand the push against whiteness and white supremacy. You see, white people didn't exist before the middle of the 17th century, as in the middle of the 1600s. And if your mind immediately went to the year 1619, then you're on to something. More on that later. And this isn't to say that lighter skinned people didn't exist. Of course they did. Europe is a real place with real people. But those people didn't identify as white people. They were Englishmen, Dutch, Germanic, Slavs, Greeks, Gauls, Scythians. Princeton history professor Dr. Nell Irvin Painter chronicles the invention of this diasporic pan-European white identity in her book, The History of White People. She demonstrates how white identity was constructed primarily as a justification for the enslavement of African people. Whiteness was from the very beginning constructed to be the antithesis of blackness. Enslavers needed some moral and philosophical cover for what they were doing to African people. And so the myth of whiteness, moral purity, superiority, ruling destiny was born. And as such, whiteness is and always has been a political identity, a fraternal order, a loyalty rewards program that depends entirely on all of its members agreeing to maintain the myth. And even though this myth has been thoroughly debunked, many are working overtime to this very day to maintain its power people did not exist before 1681. Again, white people did not exist on planet Earth until 1681. Number two, any claim that this group called white people, um, any claim that that group is rooted in biology or derived um, from genes or biology or is innate or is from nature is a lie. Third and final point, as a matter of foundational law, actually let me say it this way, white supremacy has been embedded in the United States of America from its founding as a matter of law. Now, I don't expect you to buy all that, to get all that, to believe all that, at least not now. But my job is to share with you the um, legal history that proves each of those three claims that I begin with. So let's go, let's get started. Slavery, of course, was a status that came with life, work for life. There was neither British law nor international law to prohibit or restrict slavery. What we do know is that at this time period in colonial North America, there were free persons of African descent. Um, we know that landholders um, freed slaves 
They did so in wills. They did so by allowing them to purchase their own freedom or the freedom of a family member. The vast majority of workers, laborers, um, in colonial North America at this time were British men, British workers, the vast majority. Um, there were some women, there were some European laborers from Portuguese, Dutch, um, folks from Ireland and from Scotland are also revealed in the um, records, but the vast majority were British men. There were small numbers of persons of African descent, and there were even smaller numbers of members of native tribes. Um, but in this slide, I'm trying to capture the socioeconomic ladder, and really that ladder should be about as long as this room. Um, the landholding elite are, in today's parlance, that's the 1%. And the vast majority of folks um, who were in the colonies um, were laborers. Again, they were British, other Europeans, Africans, and members of native tribes. Here's what I find folks have the most difficult time with. We tend to really struggle with getting a good picture of social life, the social context at this juncture. We're very good at understanding the social relations that exist later, and we'll talk about those in a moment. But pre-Bacon's Rebellion society is something that we generally in this country struggle to grasp. Um, so I'm going to do my best to paint a broad stroke picture um, of this time period. White people did not exist before 1681. I'm going to break up my whiteboard for this one. In the 17th century, in the Maryland and Virginia British colonies, there were freed people of British and African descent living together, working together, and marrying each other. These people were equally disgruntled with the lack of land opportunities and wealth opportunities that they could have as compared to the elite. The social ladder was very hard to climb. These people became very disgruntled, resulting in Bacon's Rebellion. This was a rebellion that involved people of multiple national origins, including Britain and African, to go against the landholding elite. This posed a major threat to capitalism because the working class was united to overthrow the elite. The colonists decided the best way to conquer these individuals was to divide them. This is a divide and conquer strategy, and it worked. It's still working today in America. The colonists decided to create the labels of race to divide the working class. They said now there's white people who are going to be afforded more privileges and advantages for being white, although they were still at the bottom of that ladder. And there were going to be black people who were stripped of their rights. They weren't allowed to marry white people. They weren't allowed to testify against white people in court. They weren't allowed to have guns. This created a psychological divide and encouraged racism. So now those two groups that were once united are now two groups of people. We have the white working class and the black working class, and then of course the indentured servants and enslaved people at the bottom. Although these white people had more privileges and advantages, there's still this entire social ladder to get the same land, wealth, and opportunity as these people. But now these people are turned onto these people because they're afraid that these people will take away their opportunities. When in fact, it's these people taking away everybody's. See this today. Think about the rural white American working class. They generally are very poor people that are never going to make it to the same degree as the 1%. These people tend to be very rich and are afraid of non-white people taking their jobs. Their minds are focused on other members of the working class because they are racist and think that those people are causing the problems. When it's been these people all along, this is how capitalism is maintained by dividing the people at the bottom 
instead of thinking, maybe we shouldn't have a ladder in the first place. Maybe we should all just be on the same standing and same ability to have opportunity. Indeed, it is a historical fact that the concept of palm coloredness as a distinct racial category emerged relatively recently in human history, around the middle of the 17th century. Now, prior to this period, individuals in Europe primarily identified based on their nationality, ethnicity, or social class, rather than a collective identity of palm color. Europe has always been inhabited by diverse peoples with varying skin tones and cultural backgrounds. The emergence of palm coloredness as a racial racial category was not a natural or inevitable development, but rather a deliberate construction shaped by social political forces and power dynamics. Now, the pivotal role of palm coloredness in justifying the enslavement and exploitation of African people is a well-documented aspect of history. Scholars such as Dr. Neil Ivan Painter have meticulously traced the evolution of palm color identity and its entanglement with systems of oppression and domination. Through her seminal work, The History of Palm Color People, Dr. Penta illuminates how the construction of palm coloredness was intricately linked to dehumanization of African people and the perpetuation of slavery. Now, this historical reality underscores the systemic nature of artism and the enduring legacy of WS. The emergence of palm coloredness as a distinct racial category was closely tied to social and economic factors, including the rise of colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. European colonizers sought to justify their exploitation and domination of indigenous people and enslaved Africans by constructing a hierarchy of races with palm coloredness positioned at the top. Palm coloredness became codified into law through various legal mechanisms such as colonial statutes and later racial segregation laws in the United States. These legal constructs reinforced the social hierarchy and entrenched WS as a foundational principle of society. The development of pseudo-scientific theories of race during the 18th and 19th centuries further solidified the concept of palm coloredness as a marker of superiority. Now, these theories which posited the inherent intellectual and moral inferiority of non-palm color races were used to justify colonization, slavery, and discriminatory practices. The concept of palm coloredness was evolved in response to waves of immigration to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, immigrants from Europe, particularly those from Southern and Eastern Europe, Europe were gradually assimilated into the category of palm coloredness as they sought to access the privileges and opportunities afforded to palm color Americans. Now, despite the legal dismantling of overtly art the cyst laws and policies, the legacy of palm coloredness continues to shape contemporary society. Palm color privilege, systemic artism, and disparities in wealth, education, and access to opportunities persist as manifestations of the enduring influence of palm coloredness. The expansion The expansion of European colonial empires played a significant role in shaping the concept of palm coloredness. As European powers conquered and colonized territories around the globe, they imposed systems of racial hierarchy that positioned palm color Europeans as superior to indigenous people and enslaved Africans. Now, this hierarchical structure served to justify the exploitation and subjugation of non palm color populations. Some historical narratives also highlight the role of religious justification justifications in the construction of palm coloredness. European colonizers often depicted themselves as bringing civilization and Christianity to savage or, or heathen peoples, further reinforcing the perception of WS. Now, the dominance of European culture and values in the realms of art, literature, philosophy, and science contributed to the elevation of palm coloredness as the normative standard of humanity. Non-palm color cultures and civilizations were often marginalized or extorcised, reinforcing the idea of palm color cultural superiority. The construction of palm coloredness intersected with other axes of identity, such as gender and class. While palm coloredness conferred certain privileges, particularly to palm color men of higher social classes, Palm color women and working class palm color people also benefited from the social status 
associated with palm coloredness albeit to varying degrees throughout history legal definitions of palm coloredness varied and were often influenced by social and political considerations in the united states for example laws such as the naturalization act of 1790 restricted citizenship to free palm color persons excluding people of african descent and indigenous people now over time legal definitions of palm coloredness evolved to include certain european ethnic groups while excluding others reflecting changing social attitudes and political interests. The emergence of scientific artism in the 19th century further solidified notions of racial hierarchy and palm coloredness. Pseudoscientific theories such as phrenology and eugenics purported to provide biological justifications for racial superiority with palm coloredness positioned as the pinnacle of human evolution. Now, these theories were used to justify colonialism, slavery, and discriminatory practices reinforcing the social and economic dominance of palm color Europeans. The portrayal of palm coloredness in popular culture and media also played a significant role in shaping perceptions of racial identity. Throughout history, depictions of palm coloredness have often been idealized and normalized while non-palm color identities have been marginalized or stereotyped. Now, this representation has perpetuated the myth of WS and contributed to the invisibility of palm coloredness as a racial category. Despite the pervasive influence of palm coloredness, there have always been individuals and groups who have resisted and critiqued its power. From abolitionists and civil rights activists to contemporary scholars and activists, voices challenge WS and the construction of palm coloredness have played a crucial role in advancing social justice and racial equality. By exposing the historical roots of palm coloredness and interrogating its impact on society, now these efforts seek to dismantle systems of oppression and create a more equitable world for all. I feel by examining these additional dimensions of the construction of palm coloredness, we gain a more nuanced understanding of its origins, manifestations, and impact on society. We have finally come to the end of the video. What do you, my viewers, have to say about this? Share your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you for watching and see you in my next video.